This is Criteria. What? There was no audio clip at the beginning of this episode like there normally is? (laughs) Why is that? That's weird. Well, if I had an audio clip to use, I would have. But maybe maybe we should start this episode with just 20 seconds of silence. That's going to be weird. I don't know what people are going to think. I mean, this is a a show about moving pictures and don't moving pictures by definition include audio? I, I don't suppose think so. Suppose not. <laughs> Thomas well, yeah, so we're here talking about our first silent film on the podcast. There'll be a number of these. Uh, there's there's four or five on the Vatican film list. We're talking about the life and passion of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, in French. Yes. The, 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 the title's in French. The film itself is not in French because, as we've already established, it's a silent film. We wanted to uh, draw on our friend base here to talk about this film we specifically wanted to find a vis- someone who might be a little more, you know, a- a- alert to the visual components of a silent film. This is Matt Kirby. He's a friend of ours. He is also a painter, which for reasons that will become clear to you in time, make him a good guest to discuss this film with us. Thank you for coming on the show, Matthew. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about your work before we get into talking about this film? Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks again for inviting me. I'm a painter, and I, I studied with another painter who is kind of the his training goes back in the French academic tradition, and also in the American impressionist tradition. And I've also studied Byzantine iconography for a few years at the Perse Pond School in New York. And I'm an avid museum goer and appreciator of colored pigment on flat surfaces. Yeah, so I thought you would be a good person to to bring in. And and of course James is an actor, a theatrical actor, and the two the two kind of like non cinematic forms that this film draws on most are, you know, painting for its composition and its framing of things and the theater for uh, its acting style and also probably for its, to some extent, for like the set decoration and stuff. It feels very theatrical. This is the, by far the oldest film on the Vatican film list. And it is one of the first artistically significant films about Jesus. It's kind of groundbreaking in a number of areas, which we'll get to. This film was first released in 1902 in more like a 30-minute version. And over the next few years, it kind of was expanded and tinkered with until it reached its complete like 44-minute form in 1905. It was released by the French uh, film company Pathé, which within like the first 10 years of motion picture production became basically the world's largest film equipment and production company. They also made uh, or major producer of phonograph records And anybody who knows a little bit about early film will recognize the name. And anybody who's also familiar with like early news footage production will know about them because they invented the whole newsreel thing that were shown in cinemas before feature films. So if you look for like old news clips, sort of like before the age of television, a lot of those will like on YouTube will say Pathé. There's even, uh, I think the first Pathé clip I ever saw was a video of Flannery O'Connor as a little girl where she was featured in like local news because she had taught her chicken to walk backwards. Oh, yeah. Actually, they just like reversed the the (laughs) film. So it was like showing the chicken walking backwards. It's like this totally random thing. Classic Flannery. So Pathé was a pretty important both in filmmaking and in film technology. This film was directed by uh, Ferdinand Zecca and Lucien Nonguet. Zecca was one of their most important producers and and directors, and I guess uh, I think he was involved on the tech side of things uh, somehow as well. But this is basically in its final form, this is one of the earliest feature length narrative films. Most films at this time were 
the very earliest films were like, you know, like 10 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute long. And most films by this time, seven or eight years into, into the history of cinema, were one reel or less. So they'd be like uh, 10 or 15 minutes long. So this was pushing the the boundaries of, of film length at the time. There was another film, I think maybe the same year, also about Jesus. And it was not quite as long as this, I think, but it may be a comparable length. What's interesting is some film historians dispute whether these should be counted as feature films because like a lot of films, especially longer films back then, they were le- released in multiple parts of one scene each. And the exhibitor at the time was left with a lot of freedom as to whether to show all the scenes together or how many scenes to show. So exhibitors in general, as you probably know, played a a much greater part in like the final product than they would today. You know, if only for the reason that the soundtrack of the film was very often provided in theater. And in the early, early days, especially when film was like this totally new thing, And uh, a lot of film clips would just be like uh, what they called actualities. I don't know if you'd call them documentary, just like a thing happening. And just the fact that it was on film was itself interesting to people. And uh, just like somebody like worker is leaving a factory at the end of uh, the end of the day. And it's like a 10 second clip. So you'd often have a person in there in the theater who was like explaining what you're about to see and commenting on things. I think I even read somewhere that they would have occasionally voice actors like behind the screen saying things but but music especially was very commonly provided by musicians in house if it was like a small you know smaller theater it could be like a small organ or something some sometimes you'd have a small orchestra I mean this kind of developed as time went on but it was a huge source of gigs for American musicians at one point like I, I it was a large percentage of working musicians in our country were working as musicians for silent films. Anyway, so what's interesting about this as a religious film too, with with the exhibitor having so much control is that depending on the audience, if you had an audience of Baptists versus Catholics, uh, I read that there was like one scene, I don't know which one it was, that, that wouldn't have been pleasing to a Baptist audience. So they removed it, for example. And also the different scenes, because this was produced over time, some parts were produced after the original release, weren't even made by the same people. I think they were different actors in some parts. And then uh, kind of like one more. Go ahead. I just wanted to say, I wonder if it's the baptism scene because it's not an immersion baptism. Ah. Oh, interesting. Would that be something that the Baptist would have a big fuss about? I'm not really sure, but I feel like every time I've seen images of a Baptist baptism, it's dunking in a river somewhere. That's interesting. I would have thought it would be like Mary or something, but there's nothing really about Mary that's not in the Bible in this this film. Maybe the miracle on the flight to Egypt, that's not in the Bible. But okay, interesting. Yeah, that's that's an interesting guess. As a final bit of trivia, and I and I have not verified this and on my second viewing I forgot to look for this, but somebody on some blog site claims that there is a rooster in every scene of this film. I saw uh, one rooster in the nativity scene. Because that's the... Pa- okay, yeah. Because that's the Pathé logo. And you can see the roosters in the, the titles for the different scenes. I saw the uh, rooster in... Uh, every every time they built a set, I think I saw a rooster. I, it kind yeah. of cracked me up. Because they, this little white rooster... I mean, right. It would be branded anytime there was a constructed set somewhere. That's so oh, funny. so it wasn't a live rooster. No, no, it's it's actually the their logo in the scene. Okay, so I didn't. White. I managed to go through the entire film without noticing it, despite having read that it was there. I saw it once, and I was so confused. I thought, are they just sort of like plugging their brand in this nativity scene? Yeah. But if it's in every scene, then that's an interesting sort of Where's Waldo game yeah. to play. Yeah. So uh, that's a fun little inside thing, but. Yeah, I have some more information about, you know, the coloring and some of the the technical process for making it, but we'll we can save that for later. But anyway, it just goes to show you that we're we're dealing with a whole different era of film and and one which, you know, basically any silent film especially from this early on, we're very like fortunate to have because I think like 80% of silent films that were ever made are lost. They were not considered things that would be watched decades later and 
and just based on the way that they were exhibited and what was required to do it and the technology used, people didn't see the reason to to save these things. So yeah, so it's it's a whole different paradigm really for for filmmaking, but but it's it's very interesting and I I think it's worth giving it a chance and seeing if you can kind of like acclimatize yourself to it because it, it can be rewarding and a different kind of contemplative experience. Yeah, I thought that this film holds up extremely well. I mean, I, ha- I haven't seen a ton of silent films, but I've seen a few. And for whatever reason, going into this film, I guess my expectations were pretty low, uh, especially nowadays when we have series like The Chosen or a film like Mel Gibson's The Passion, where the life of Jesus or these biblical scenes are so fully realized um, in these really spectacular and cinematic ways. And with modern acting conventions that we can relate to more totally. Readily. Yeah, I, I didn't have very high expectations going into this, but but actually, upon watching it a couple of times, I think that it holds up extremely well. I think that it's surprisingly ambitious that the production really doesn't shy away from anything. They they dive right into, okay, well, is it Jesus walking on the water? Let's do that. Or is it the ascension? Let's figure out how to show that. Or, you know, even, even the passion sequences with the scourging and the crucifixion were still quite effective. I, I found, you know, myself really being drawn into a contemplation, as you say, Thomas, of our Lord's passion. But just, you know, in general throughout, I thought that it's quite an ambitious feature that is quite spectacularly produced, whether it's the sets or the costuming, the sheer number of people that they're able to get on on screen at any given time. There's a lot of bodies that are employed, live animals. (laughs) It's something just kind of is especially nowadays when I've become increasingly used to seeing animals depicted with CGI on screen to see a real fish or a real donkey is its own kind of delight. I thought that, uh, that this film still has a lot to interest people if only on a visual level but also in its its success in presenting and representing a lot of these scriptural scenes. I've, I've watched a couple silent film clips, you know, but I'm not really super familiar with it. And I think, you know, haven't watched one in years. And, or I should say silent film clips from this era. And um, the first thing was just the, that struck me was the frenetic energy um, it, it took me like a little while to get used to the, I guess the speed of the film and kind of what seemed to me like the jerkiness of the motions. But as I went, progressed through the first viewing and I watched it again, I thought it was kind of almost hypnotic, you know, and um, it had kind of like this tactile energy that... To me, actually, you know, and I'm thinking about it through the lens of the visual arts, because Thomas, that's what you asked me to think about and why you invited me to be on the show. So I was thinking painting, you know, and, and, you know, thinking about classical compositions, of you know, scenes from the the life and, and passion of Christ. I think it almost reminded me more of some kind of secondary arts you know, like etchings, if you've seen those, Gustav, uh, is it Dore etchings, really? Another name that, well, the first name that jumped out at me, uh, who who is a painter, was a painter, it was Jacques Jacques Tussaud. But it it didn't really remind me of his his paintings, or not his oil paintings, but, um, you know, late in life, he died in 1902, so that was the year the film came out is when he did those watercolors of pretty much every thing that the New Testament mentions that Christ did. I think early 1900s too, Leonard and Landrock were black and white photographers in North Africa. Well, so, you know, those, 
the the costumes, you know, all this these stripes and checks that were sort of starting to drive me nuts by the end of it. I, I think that's all their attempt to be historical, and that's you know maybe what uh, Palestinians were wearing in 1910 or something. I, I don't know, but you see a lot of those in the Tissot watercolors as well, and that together with the sheer number of people, you know, as James was mentioning in front of the camera and the kind of shallow depth of field, you know, you weren't, there were a couple of scenes where you were drawn into the background, but that was a rarity. Usually it's these sort of flat sets. Everything is kept close. That, that almost reminded me a little bit of, you know, reliefs like you would see in a modern or not modern, but an American Catholic parish, you know, of the, the stations. So I thought there were a lot of resonances, but it, it didn't really, I wouldn't really call it, I didn't really think of it as a painterly film in the way that I feel like, you know, people might speak about Tarkovsky or something like that. It was very visual, but a different, a kind of a refreshingly kind of tactile feel for a film. I like what you said about this frenetic energy, because it's true that the, the scenes are very abbreviated. You know, responses happen very quickly if they happen at all. And there's kind of this collapsed sense of of the passage of time, you know, not just in the scenes themselves, but then certainly in the piece as a whole. You know, I think that it's one of its strengths is that you move from the infancy narratives you know, from the Annunciation to the Ascension within, you know, 40 minutes or so. Yeah. That in the same way that one might flip through, you know, like a collection of Doré's uh, prints and kind of get this holistic picture of the New Testament. Whereas a painting is, it's intended more for like extended contemplation. Right. So I, I think that this, this this film sort of straddles that. I think this film sort of achieves a nice balance in drawing you in in these little vignettes that sometimes are just a single scene, a single image, but then not letting you stay there too quickly before you're moved along to the next scene. There's this nice... It's frenetic, but I think it's also... It feels deliberately paced. And then at, by the end of it, there's this uh, impression of the total, of the totality that, that right. you're left with. It's closer to like a ro- the pace of a rosary or the de- decade of the rosary. Totally, but, totally. But even shorter than that. The film is 44 minutes long and there's, I forget how many scenes, but there's somewhere between 30 and 40 scenes. So that means, you know, each scene is not much more than a minute. Mm-hmm. And probably a lot of them are shorter than that. And I think that also makes this film pretty accessible attention span wise for a silent film compared to many that I've seen. Of course, I've gotten more accustomed to watching silent films as time goes by. But I think the first one I ever watched was Sergei Eisenstein's uh, Battleship Potemkin. And I had to take like multiple breaks, mm-hmm. come back to it. But th- this scene is like, it's not too hard to watch in one in one sitting. Uh, just to speak to a couple of the technical things you mentioned, Matt, as far as the depth of field goes, I forget the technical term for this, but there there is a type of focus that was not invented in film yet that could allow you to, I think, like some kind of long focus type thing. That's a factor here. As to the speed too, uh, it's worth mentioning a lot of people's experience of silent film is that the motion is like weirdly fast. A lot of that is because for a long time, people would show silent films and they didn't really have the right idea of what speed it was supposed to be played at because it's filmed at a different frame rate. So I think if you go on YouTube nowadays and look for a a classic silent film, you're more likely to find something closer approximating the speed that it would have originally been shown at than you would have if you had watched a silent film, you know, like in the 80s or maybe in the early days of the internet. So uh, there's been a lot of of technical hurdles and research that's had to be done in like – restoring these films or, or displaying them properly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It'd be interesting. I feel like this version that we watched was pretty fast. But I thought uh, one thing, too, is there's, there were changes in within the scenes where the pace was 
really fascinatingly quick. One that jumped out at me was the um, driving the, the money changers from Temple, where Christ just employs this like this awesome like beating technique and goes after these guys and, and completely changes in character and just really efficiently drives these guys from the temple. And then a few seconds later, he's got his arm around one of the apostles. I don't know if it's supposed to be John. And it's kind of like, they're sort of gone back into this like contemplative conversation. Like you expect like Benedictine monks to have, and they kind of walk off the screen. I'm like, but I thought that was a pretty interesting transition. Yeah. There's another, in fact, in the very first one with Mary, the whole exchange between her and the angel happens so quickly. And Mary is so that you don't get a whole lot of sense of shock or alarm or questioning. It's, it's yeah, very abbreviated and we move right through it, which it was, it was like a, an opportunity for me to reflect, you know, more deeply on Mary's disposition and Mary's faith, because it was so kind of jarring to me how, how quickly this happens. I've, I've, recently been reading about this kind of first decade of, of film and uh, watched a bunch of these short early films, including some that have sets uh, and colors very much like this film, because often these kind of these kinds of sets uh, were used in either historical or fantastic films. There's a great f- uh, film called uh, The Kingdom of the Fairies by Melies, which which has a similar, although more surreal aesthetic in the sets. And to me, it's evocative of like a pop-up book or like a diorama or something like that. And even the characters uh, sometimes feel like, you know, cutouts uh, at times. So it's something I find very delightful. And even though these sets are, are, these sets are at once primitive and very detailed and impressive. I think there's a great charm to it that is not, lost with time and i and i feel that way about not all but some of the special effects used in early silent films which i find really fascinating with people being lowered down uh holes in the ground and imps and goblins popping out of thin air and fire things and in in voyage of the fairies uh, kingdom of the fairies there's underwater things that they filmed through an aquarium and they actually in front of the actors and cutouts and stuff they you're sh- they're shooting through an aquarium that has fish and crabs and stuff in it. So these actual fish are swimming around incorporated into the set somehow. And it's just this, it's this, just this magical thing. And although, you know, th- this, this film we're discussing is a little bit more historically based and restrained. Uh, it still does have this, something about the set still does have this kind of like childlike fairy tale quality to it, which I really enjoy. I did too. Yeah, I think it is it cabinet of Dr. Caligari that also has a lot of those urban paper sets. And some of these remind me of that. But like you said, you know, much more historically and architecturally accurate. But yeah, there there is a there is a charm to them. I think that's a good way of putting it. And then for me, it had the effect too of when you leave the world of the constructed set, it would happened suddenly and like without any kind of hint that this is going to happen, you know, and the one I remember is when during the, the childhood of Jesus at Nazareth, suddenly they're out on it, this grassy hillside, which I, I don't know where it was. I, I picture it being in France, but, but Jesus is kind of like stumbling up the hill to catch up with Joseph. He was much bigger. And then they're bringing this log down and, you can see sort of every bramble and blade of grass all of a sudden. And I really enjoyed that that juxtaposition, that quick change to the, the real world. Yeah, that's a really good point. Because there's a number of a number of times when a sort of real world setting is employed, specifically in these in, in these infancy narratives, I think uh, when they're fleeing. There's a scene where they're kind of out on the hillside, but then also during Jesus's public ministry, there's a scene where it looks like he's outside again. He's healing. A scene with Jairus's daughter. I think it it, it pans over into a constructed set, but I think the camera begins 
in a sort of, uh, yeah. well, in a real... And vice versa for the nativity. Pans were very unusual at this time. Basically, you almost never had moving cameras. And, and the, the pans in this do feel kind of like very slow and laborious. It's just interesting how the technology shapes so much of the artistic quality of these pieces in terms of their influence from theater and the visual arts with just like a closed frame. It took a while. I think I said this in a previous episode, maybe, but uh, the first moving cameras were just cameras that were placed on boats. So I think the very first time was they put it on a gondola in Venice and like shot some of Venice from a gondola. And then they did the same thing with like a boat on the Nile. Because whatever, however the cameras were constructed, they they weren't easy to to turn or move. But this, I don't know how, how they did it, but this this has three or four pans at least in the film. Close ups are also very rare in silent film. There's two close ups in this film, both at very significant moments in the Passion, the Ecce Homo moment and the uh, Veil of Veronica. There's a there's a close up of that. In this film, you do have some nice, aside from the few pans, you do have some nice matching where somebody will uh, leave on one side of the frame and then it'll cut to a new set and they'll enter, you know, from the, the correct side. So there's a sort of continuity there. Yeah, and then- I think the, the, the flight into Egypt sequence is the most complicated in, in its editing because we it takes them from... Well, that that's actually an amazing sequence. It begins with the angels adoring the infant Christ right, in yeah, the cool. home, and then they disappear, and then it's an empty room. So that's like, first off, a really cool way to begin that sequence because you're kind of, the veil is pulled back and you see the sort of spiritual reality before Joseph enters to a seemingly empty room and he goes to sleep and then there's the whole angel warn, warning him in a dream. But then that sequence takes us all the way to Egypt, to the very foot of the Sphinx. So there's a lot that happens in between, as opposed to some of the other sequences that are just a single scene or a single pan. This has a lot of intricate cuts where we see the Holy Family leave their home and then it cuts outside to them outside of the home. But then we also see the soldiers pursuing them there's like a battle sequence with an angel defending them. It's a really impressive sequence. Yeah, so I mean, we we can see in this this film the early development of of some of these techniques of continuity um, before editing became easier, before moving cameras became easier, and the the filmmakers are slowly over this first decade or decade and a half are are figuring out okay, what can we do to break through the limitations of this one this one frame? It is still very, you know, visual, very much like a, a painting or something in some respects, very much like a stage for a play in some respects, but you can see the artifice that takes it to a more unique place as, as an art form. I think that seeing the limitations that are being challenged or overcome is part of the delight, especially in the special effects. Yeah. There's a particular kind of delight in seeing, wow, how the, how they were able to pull that one off. Right. That's kind of lost nowadays when special effects are so masked over. I, For whatever reason, I'm thinking about how in recent years we've seen films try to resurrect dead actors, you know, via CGI. I'm specifically thinking about Star Wars yeah, Rogue One. Yeah. And and how that seems to be like, to me, that seems to suggest a misplaced notion of realism that isn't operating in these early films where there is no kind of pretense. Nobody thinks for a moment that the artifice isn't visible anymore. So there's kind of like an embracing of the sense of the artificial. Right. And and in embracing that, I think the result is something that's somehow more more satisfying, more spectacular. These close-ups, for instance, there's something really striking about, especially the the Behold the Man, the Ecce Homo close-up. There's something so striking about it because 
it's so, you know, on one level, we could say, well, that's not very realistic. What happened to all of his surroundings? What happened to all the people around him? Because in the close up, all we see is Jesus and the words Ece Homo behind him on, you know, a blank canvas. But in another sense, there's something that's so much more, well, if not realistic, more eloquent. And I think the embrace of artifice is what part part of what contributes to like the childlike quality Mm -hmm. of this film. And I think also because of the the acting style and a number of other things about it, you have to kind of embrace a childlike spirit to 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 enter into it. There's a nice article by Stephen Gradanis, 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 uh, the Catholic film critic, about this film. And he's using it as an example of why of how it's good to watch silent films with young children, and they they have a greater uh, capacity to appreciate it when they're that age than uh, than adults who sort of like aren't used to it, and also that that you can explain because there's no talking, you can explain things to the children and have like a commentary going, which is in fact how some silent sh- films are originally shown to the children. So it's a very I would recommend I we'll we'll link to that article in the show notes and also if I didn't already mention this is on YouTube this film so I'll link to that as well for people to watch it but it wouldn't be a bad idea to, to watch that with your kids and why not give them the capacity to appreciate that when you can and then they will be able to appreciate it later Yeah I agree with that and I think that it's also worth actually watching spending time with the silence. You know, I, I moved to New York in 99 and there was a sort of a trend in the early 2000s of showing things like the Battleship Potemkin with orchestras outdoors and which is its own thing, you know, and it, it was fun, but I, I you, you don't really analyze like it. I feel like the sound overwhelms what's, what's on screen and I mean, this just sitting there, you know, in front of my com- computer screen in, in silence for 45 minutes, it was it was a completely different form of, of contemplation, I think. I recently picked up a collection of Bach arias, and I was listening to those in the background while I watched. So I kind of scored it. I, I, I gave the film my own sort of custom score, and it was fun to see how it would align in certain places. But then during the passion sequence, uh, I found pretty organically and intuitively that I I hit the music off and just watched that in silence. Right. When we were watching it again today, we were making all sorts of humorous remarks for like the first half of the film. And then we kind of like shut up once it got to the passion because we were pointing out some of the quirky aspects and and things. I watched it in silence both times. There's There's two or three different versions of this on YouTube, some of which have different modern soundtracks. And I think this was the first silent film of any significant length that I've watched where it didn't have a soundtrack attached to it. But yeah, I liked I liked watching it in silence. And and because the scenes are so short, it, it um, again, it's easy to pay attention and keep engaged, uh, even with no soundtrack. Yeah, it is a more contemplative experience, even with uh, without the music. And it's it's very effective. I think there's there's a debate sort of like silent film circles, if there are such things, about whether it's better to watch it with a modern soundtrack or with silence. Despite the fact that, yes, usually these had music provided on the spot when they were shown, uh, people, some people feel like adding a, 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 a more recent composed soundtrack is not sort of like authentic or whatever. And I've seen, I've seen films, the, the video of uh, Kingdom of the Fairies for example, on YouTube has an awesome, like pretty recent modern soundtrack that contributes greatly to like the surrealism and weirdness of the film, this avant-garde classical thing with electronic elements to the score and stuff, which which it, I feel like it makes it pop and adds a lot. But, you know, a lot of the times the, and I'm sure this was a feature of, of the music even back then, but the, a lot of the times the modern scores that I'll hear for silent films really lean into like the hokiness and the sentimentalism of it. So in this case, I thought, you know, I'm just going to watch it without the music. Yeah. At the art school that I attended, a really cool experience that I had a few times was getting to see various silent films screened with 
students from the School of Music performing their own particularized score. So one I'll never forget was seeing F.W. Murnau's Faust with this heavy metal band accompanying. And it was like the most metal experience I've ever had. But I think that actually, you know, that experience was a lot closer to, you know, what would have been the experience for a lot of early film goers seeing these silent films and not, yeah, as you say, Thomas, this sort of like hokey idea of of what silent film scoring with was. like a player with like a crappy sounding player piano or yeah, something. Exactly. You know? the, I, I know uh, something even today people will uh, they'll have their things where organists will improvise a score to a silent film, which I'd love to see that sometime. We should talk about the color a little bit. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that color was much more commonly used in silent films than it was in the black and white talkies, which followed them. I, there And there is a technical reason for why it was easier, and I can't remember what the reason is. But basically, color disappeared in the early days of sound films uh, and returned, you know, started returning in the late 30s, I guess, gradually and became more common after that. Yeah, so, but the way color is used is very different, of course, than it is now. The easiest thing for them to do would be to tint the entire frame one color. And there was a sort of a convention where like red meant fire, blue meant nighttime, green meant, I think, mysterious and surreal. But some of these films go a step further and they have this more specified coloring of not the entire frame, but of select parts, often like costumes uh, or shrubbery or or special effects and things like that are given uh, a selective color. So if you guys don't mind, I'd like to read a little bit about the process because it's, it's an interesting, very, very painstaking, kind of reminds you of pre-computer animation in its, in its painstakingness. So this process is called Pathé Color, and it's, it's a stencil-based film tinting process. So each frame, I'm just going to read from Wikipedia here, each frame of an extra print of the black and white film to be colored with rear projected onto a sheet of frosted glass, uh, as in rotoscoping. An operator used a blunt stylus to trace the outlines of areas of the projected image that were to be tinted one particular color. The stylus was connected to a reducing pantograph, uh, which is basically it's a mechanical linkage which connects two pens uh, so that the movement, movement of one pen when you're tracing an image produces a similar movement in the other pen. Hmm. Anyway, so basically, this this pantograph would cause a sharp blade to cut corresponding outlines through the actual film frame, hmm. which would create the stencil for that color in the frame. And this had to be done for each individual frame. Wow. Uh, and as many different stencil films had to be made as uh, there were colors to be added. Wow. And then each of the final projection prints was matched up with one of the stencil films and run through a machine that applied the corresponding dye through the stencil – and then that was repeated using each stencil and wow. different color dye in turn. I wonder if anybody has done the math looking at this film and the number of colors that are used, you know, just how many different film reels would have had to be used for any given shot. But that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So I've seen a number of films that use this this technique and it always it is it is cool and and again, you know, it it adds to that that childlike quality because the whole frame isn't colored. So you have these like little magical pops of color yeah. that really you don't take for granted. Even, yeah, exactly. Even just the suggestion of color is surprisingly effective. Right. It is. And they, they, I, I don't really remember too many places where they colored Christ or his garments. And I feel like the way that they used it was almost more, abstractly and compositionally than to like draw attention to Jesus. Like some of the, um, you know, there's scenes where he's in the crowd and the Roman soldiers will be this bright yellow and you can almost miss him. And I, I feel like it's interesting that they did that and they just kind of allowed, you know, they didn't artificially um, 
make him bright red or something. That's true. So, yeah, I think the scenes with the most color are the scenes with like the crowd, with the mob showing up, you know, and, and mm. various colors on people's outfits. Yeah. You get this sort of sense of the the loudness of the the metropolitan, maybe. But yeah, the one the one time Christ is colored differently is in the Transfiguration, where that sequence is pretty amazing because it's very seamless when his robes become just totally white and his hair becomes a yellowish color and it's it's uh it it yeah seamlessly transitions between that and then back into you know non transfigured Jesus James I'm curious of your impression of the acting style used in this film and especially some of the gestures which at on first viewing might be occasionally like puzzling to to interpret there's a lot of heavy gesticulation even for silent films which often have more gesticulation because of the lack of close-ups and and of course the lack of sound even for a silent film this is very exaggerated almost actually that that in itself also ha- almost has a painterly quality in the sense that in a painting you'll have someone frozen in one dramatic gesture or like you know right. whatever arm pointed out or thrown back and uh there's a lot of that in in this film i don't know exactly what they're drawing from there but sometimes it's very effective sometimes it's it's a little quirky yeah well you know i think that it's the same conversation that we've been having about special effects you know like what's lost with a certain emphasis on realism you know, I, I think that that nowadays that's really the spirit of of a lot of film that's produced is like we judge it based on how realistic it looks, whether it's the acting or the special effects or what have you. But you know what what's lost? You know, I mean, we have to recognize that that naturalism or realism is a stylistic choice itself. You know, and that that when we watch a film like this where there is certainly a certain nod toward a kind of historical realism. It's not something that they're precious about. So in the gestures, I think that's really evident. Yeah, at times it seems quirky or off-putting, sometimes even laughable. You know, like well, the the actor who plays Joseph has a... a uh, he, he repeats this gesture of just throwing his arms up into the air like astonishment yeah Yeah. (laughs) but but then at other times i think it's it's really effective you know i'm thinking about for instance the the scourging at the pillar where we have christ in the center of the frame and the those who are scourging him kind of framed around him in these different stances kind of in the four corners of him and all just wailing into him and there's this exaggerated quality to it there is even a kind of painterly quality in the way that they're they're arranged and the way that that the stance that each has adopted but in that is something kind of uniquely effective another repeated gesture throughout is pointing upwards it's something that that the angels do. It's something that various characters do throughout, but it's something that's repeated most obviously by Christ. When he performs a miracle, especially. Yes. And so I I really appreciate that too, because I think- He looks up or- Exactly. Exactly. In fact, you know, um, this is something that I was thinking about most recently in watching the Republican convention. I didn't even bother watching the Democratic convention, but, you know, the, 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 convention each night was opened with a prayer and kind of being just alert to the gestures employed in prayer. I thought that Cardinal Dolan on the first night when he led the prayer did a really smart move in, if you watch it, he he's he changes his, his facing a number of times. He looks up a lot. He'll look down a lot. And there, he'll pick moments to look straight ahead into the camera as well. And I, I just thought that that was very effectively done in communicating to us as viewers watching this on a screen who may or may not be actually praying along with him, that this prayer is directed somewhere to our Father 
in heaven, but also that there is a interiority to it on the part of the cardinal himself. And I, I thought he captured that in, in his going downward as often as he did. Then also there's a sense in which that this is, well, something that we do in common um, and and that that was captured in his looking up. Some of the, I think this, the second night was kind of a non-denominational minister, ministress, I don't know. She she delivered her entire prayer to the camera, and I thought that that conveyed something different about where her point of reference was. And no no judgment here, but maybe a little bit of judgment. But um, but anyway, that's a little bit of a tangent to say that that I think that gesture still matters quite a bit in terms of visual and performance vocabulary and that the way that this is used in this film while at times off-putting i think is also at times quite eloquent you know and and succinct in what it express yeah in what it's able to express this gesture there's the gesture of jesus pointing up there's also the of him looking up uh perhaps in prayer or mm-hmm. in gratitude it it also feels like he in looking up it is also de- demonstrative to the people surrounding him this is a gesture that on the chosen the recent tv series jonathan rumi the actor who plays jesus also uses a lot but usually when he does it it has a more of a private the feel of a private moment between jesus and his father he really effectively communicates that the relationship between the son and the father in these moments when jesus has just performed a miracle or just accomplished something and he looks up to the father with love and gratitude yeah, where functions similarly but has a slightly different tone to mm-hmm. it than in this film but i feel like it is this um i don't know to what extent these things are implied in the gospels these gestures but to me it feels like an extension of this moment at the last supper when he's giving thanks to the father mm-hmm. and, and that this kind of same thing has been extended to a lot of the other wonders that that jesus works right. throughout the the right. gospel story I was also struck by the energetic way that it kind of like hieratic way that the people prayed to Jesus over and over again. Uh, as soon as a miracle is performed, Lazarus jumps up and kneels, then kneels down and starts praying. Uh, Jairus's daughter does the same thing. The I feel the most striking examples were at the beginning when the wise men and their entourage show up. And I was happy to see them with this huge crowd instead of just the three three of them. And Mary like lifts up baby Jesus, this so what seems like a, a live naked baby um, used in the film, and just sort of uh, spins around, showing it to everyone in the room. And they just fall down, you know, like I mean, you might like people might at uh, benediction or sort or sort of bow down. And I thought there was a very, I mean, that struck me as very Catholic and per, maybe very French, you know, but there was no doubt visually that Jesus was being worshipped as God from the beginning of the movie to the end. Of course, we also see this with characters, how they behave towards angels as well, yes. to some extent. Yeah. Um, and, but, you know, it's kind of an ambiguous gesture at times. But but yeah, I think it does function that way in that in that scene in particular. Um, combined with her, with Mary's gesture. Yeah. I found myself when, while watching this, there there was a kind of detachment, you know, whereas, whereas if I, if I watched something like the passion or the chosen, I'm drawn in and immersed into the world of this, this, this story with this, I found myself just as much watching early 20th century Frenchmen portraying Jesus and this these scriptural narratives as I was watching, you know, the story itself. Right. So there was kind of like for me, there was like this meta story operating where I found myself just reflecting on this great tradition of representing Christ through art. You know, I was so grateful. I am so grateful that this film sort of exists here at the dawn of cinematography. Because so much evil has been perpetrated on mankind through film and through cinema, even from the very beginning. And 
I'm so grateful that that at the same time at the beginning, you know, the flag for Christ is planted on this medium as well. And that it's linked up into this this grand tradition of carrying the incarnation forward through the arts. And and so watching this film and thinking about that, there was something simultaneously awesome, kind of awe-inspiring about that, while also quaint, you know, seeing how short our attempts come, you yeah. know, at, at actually capturing the mystery of the incarnation and, and of, of these these events. That's certainly no less true now than it was in 1903 or 1905. It might be more apparent in watching a 1903 attempt, seeing how how sh- short this comes up. But in that sense, it's maybe even more truthful. We're just children playing at pageants when we set our brush to this subject. But that doesn't make it any less noble or awesome of an enterprise. And and I think that this film exemplifies that. Yeah. And you're right that, you know, all these factors were there from the beginning. And Ferdinand, I think it was Ferdinand Zecca uh, who directed this film also made not pornographic films, but he, he made some films that were kind of like risque where I think one of them was a, a short shot of a woman on a balcony beginning to undress or something. And so, yeah, I mean, even with the same artist, there were all these different things going on. You can see the same thing about many of the actors who played characters in Mel Gibson's The Passion, right? who have done all sorts of things they shouldn't do on camera. And yet here they are involved in this great right. uh, religious film. One of the most remarked upon scenes in this film is the final shot of the Ascension, which I think is is one of the best effects in the film, if not the best. The way that they have Jesus, instead of going straight up or disappearing, receding slowly further and further away and up, and then sort of merging into this this vision of the heavenly court is really great. You finally get the vision of you know, what Jesus has been pointing to all along. It's very effectively done. Matt, did you have any scenes in particular that jumped out at you, that struck you? Watching it the second time, you know, I, I mentioned the young, young Jesus with Joseph, but a lot of those scenes surrounding the early life of Christ, I thought were just really, there's less to portray maybe, so it, it was a little bit, more intimate and kind of homely. Uh, but I really appreciated those, you know, even the beginning with the Annunciation, you know, Mary kind of just walks into the room and sets down her water jug and like immediately goes to pray. And I think it, and then the angel appears, it sort of establishes the pace and the, the feel for the whole film pretty remarkably well. And, you know, I, I felt like that, that set the tone and that we're getting, you know, I felt like we were getting this French, maybe sort of working class Mary, as opposed to, you know, a Renaissance painting where she might have her, be at her like pre-do with her stack of books. And that, that pace just kind of continued through the film. And it really, when I watched it again, I was kind of like, this is a lot like, I don't know if this is accidental or intentional, but the pace of the Gospels, I mean, maybe even particularly the Gospel of Mark, you know, you, you read them and they are just sort of like, they're not like news reports, but they're kind of matter of fact. And for me, I was sort of glad that the, the passion scenes were sort of mercifully short in that, you know, I think it gave you an overview. And, and I, I have kind of like a, the Passion, you know, Mel Gibson's The Passion, I don't know really, I have like mixed feelings about that. I just, I feel like I'm sort of being forced to appreciate something in a certain dimension, whereas the Gospels themselves kind of like allow you maybe to go there or not, or to, it allows it to breathe a little bit more. And I thought that this, like, whether that was intentional or not, it kind of created these little spaces for contemplation among the kind of like hecticness of life, you know, and even the, 
it was all business. You know, even the crucifixion, it's like, well, they successfully nailed him to the cross. You know, now let's hoist the thing up. Maybe a maybe sort of a workmanly view of life, uh, but yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I think that that's really well observed because for me, watching this and especially thinking about what this may have been like for an audience in 1903 or 1904 watching this, you know, what jumped out at me was these kind of more intimate or banal moments. One in particular is during the flight into Egypt when Joseph and Mary stop off at a, a, a little like stream, this water coming from a rock and Joseph gives Mary a drink of water and we see Mary take the vessel and put it to her lips and drink. I just thought, man, that's so cool. You know, that has never been before this. That's never been portrayed like that sequence of events. Yes. You know, yes. It can't be shown in any other way than, than through a film. Right. Or I suppose maybe if it's performed live in a pageant of sorts, but, but that the camera captures these, these moments that are, you know, I guess more performative, you know, like you were saying, okay, we're going to nail him to the cross and then we're going to get this cross up there. In fact, that that drinking is echoed later on at the well with the woman from Samaria when she actually hands Jesus the vase and and he drinks from from it as well. And I and I, you know, I've I've heard that story as many times as I as I've heard it, you know, proclaimed that gospel passage proclaimed at mass. But seeing it on the screen and seeing Jesus drink water was it, it it was something special. Yeah. And I think you're right that this is unique to film and it's a big part of The Chosen as a TV series, especially because they have the time to show these things. Right. There's a lot of Jesus, uh, remarkable shots of Jesus alone making a camp and kindling fire mm-hmm. with sticks. Mm-hmm. And and doing physical work and like getting his back into it, yeah, uh, which is really interesting. It's something right. that that. But but what's cool is is also going back to what you said, Matt, about the pacing is how much of this they fit in with such short scenes, right? And how many also how many establishing moments they they fit in where the first thing you see is not Jesus or another principal character entering the scene. I mean, think of the scene where uh, they're first looking for a room in the inn. There's quite a bit of time spent with just all these other people passing through this this part of town. Another example of that would be the establishing, and I suppose this is a more of a practical establishing shot, but the the establishing of the the marketplace in the temple before Jesus comes in. And there's there's probably more that I can't think of right now, but it's it's amazing how many of those cool things that they they fit in yeah. with such little time yeah. as compared to a you know six year season uh, television series yeah I, I was happy to see Joseph really get into it with that innkeeper too I mean, you could <laughs> you could tell he was he was pissed yeah he's like can you believe this and Mary is exasperated and tired yeah. and you yeah. see that. I feel um, like Joseph is a great jo- the, Joseph receives a great characterization in this in this film and one scene that really struck me was the scene you've already mentioned it Matt when he and the child Jesus are out working they're cutting down this this what's left of this tree but after they do so Joseph hoists the log onto his shoulder and Jesus hoists the axe onto his shoulder and they go marching off. And I thought that, wow, like here visually represented is how Joseph trains Jesus, not just in work, not just as a carpenter, but as a man bearing his cross, you know, that the gesture that we see in Joseph placing this log on his shoulder and walking with it mirrors almost exactly Jesus walking, the the adult Jesus walking with his cross. And to see Joseph walking with that log on his back, but then the child Jesus walking with the axe on his back, it's like... Clearly struggling to to carry it. Yeah, you know, it, it, it shows... 
it, it communicated to me Joseph's presence at the crucifixion, you know, in having been the one who taught Jesus to be a man. Right. Uh, what about scenes that struck you as the most odd or funny in this <laughs> film? Uh, the draft of fishes was probably <laughs> the worst special effect in the entire film. <laughs> Which I mean, part? Jesus, appe- like, Jesus appearing or the uh, the fish themselves? Yeah, the, the fish, I mean, they managed to net, you know, about 10 fish. That's the <laughs> miracle. And then they, they accidentally let half of them fall back into the water. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, for anybody who... I, not to mention the chosen a bajillion times, but that's one of the best scenes in the chosen is the uh, in season one is the the miracle of the fishes. But yeah, in this film, it's totally underwhelming yeah. the fish that they catch. So this is one of the, the, the this this scene is for some reason, even though presumably this in the gospel occurs much earlier than the miracle than when he walks on water. The scene is combined with Jesus walking on water, and the, the I think one of the most ridiculous things in the film is definitely this the first frame with jesus it kind of mirrors his coming out of the tomb but it it works much better when he comes out of the tomb when he just sort of rises he rises out of the water and it's like (laughs) what was he doing down there where did he come from and then he just sort of wanders And, and, and instead of like coming straight in one direction he kind of like wanders around the frame a little bit and it's like Hey Peter, <laughs> where are you guys? Uh, and then, and then, and then goes to the fishermen, and Jesus appears like, kind of like coming from the water, but he's actually like coming from land in the frame, and yeah. it's just kind of this weird. Uh, and they don't show the part with Peter trying to walk on water. Yeah, well, well, you know, I think you can interpret these scenes as being collapsed together because we see him walking on water in both but they are demarcated by separate title cards right so maybe it's just being placed out of order yeah you know i don't know why but Um, it is a very strange choice oh real quick i wanted to go back to i wanted to mention something you said about these ordinary actions is another part of that in this film is that this is so close to the time when a lot of early films were literally just like ordinary actions, order, like like yeah. a five second clip of like a baby, yeah, like drinking from a bottle or something. Right. So so there's a lot of that like fascination with like just the novelty as well mm-hmm. still there. Um, another film that we kind of laughed about was the wedding at Cana. I don't know. Oh what yeah, thought of this. That scene, scene was Matthew. really funny, but. Because in the gospel, the the wedding feast at Cana, like that whole miracle happened so behind the scenes. Like you get the impression that, you know, Mary's aware of what's going on. The servants are probably aware of what's just happened. But that, you know, the the, the actual wedding guests and the head waiter are, are totally oblivious. Like in just thinking, oh, you've saved the best wine for last. But here it's in this film, it's like a party trick like where Jesus, you know, does it in front of everyone and everybody's like very surprised, but then just goes back to partying. Yeah. And also uh, it's interesting. The water is like, it looks like it's milk. Yeah. It's very white. Pouring in. I yeah. think probably just maybe so it's more visible or something. Maybe. But James also pointed out that, <laughs> The, 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 they're supposed to be filling the jugs to the brim, but they're using one jug that's the same size as all the other jugs. So <laughs> so I don't know just, if that's part of the miracle. He, or he's like, just taken the contents uh, of a single jug and divided them among four jugs. It's like, yeah. that's not what happened. <laughs> it's like about as much milk as I add to my coffee in the morning. <laughs> Daintily pours it in each jug. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. So anyway, this film was a lot of fun. You know, it, it, it was... It, it was at times humorous, at times profound, always interesting, and I think you know it 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 earns its spot on the Vatican film list, but also I think its place in this tradition of of you know the the gospel narratives being rendered, the incarnation being rendered visible to us in in art yeah I'm kind of interested to, I'll be interested to see the other Christ film that was put out around the same time as this and kind mm-hmm. of see how different the approach might have been. So, yeah, uh, I, I, again, we recommend checking this out. It's on YouTube. Maybe watch it with your kids. 
our next film is going to be our most purely entertaining film that we've done so far easily. That will be The Lavender Hill Mob, which is a heist film, heist comedy from the 50s starring Alec Guinness. It's it's great fun. It's kind of an odd pick for the for the list, I think, but it's a very enjoyable film, and I think a lot of people will like it. This one is not available for streaming, so you would have to rent it or buy it online. Or... I did get a free trial to FlixFling.com. FlixFling? FlixFling. F-L-I-X-F-L-I-N-G, I think, is the name of the okay. website. And it's streaming there, so you can get your seven-day trial and then cancel it. But uh, Matt, thanks so much for joining us here on the show. Thanks for having me, guys. And if anybody wants to join in the discussion of these films or, or hang out with us otherwise, you can join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Catholic pods. And we'll see you next time with Lavender Hill Mob. I almost forgot to say that if you'd like to check out Matt's artwork and read an essay he wrote, you can go to mkkirby.com. That's mkkirby.com. See you next time.